The Cedar Prize Lecture was instituted in 1989 and honors an outstanding science contribution to Cedar. Uh, the nomination is based on a research paper uh, reported in a peer-reviewed publication uh, within the previous four years. Um, I think in this case it's more about the uh, extended body of research. Um, the June 2011 Cedar Strategic Plan uh, document describes priorities of our community and uh, the prize award winner is um, uh, com contributing or speaking to so those priorities. Uh, the, le the prize lecture is open to non-US citizens as well as US citizens, provided there's a strong connection to CEDAR that can be demonstrated. Here to introduce this year's CEDAR Prize Lecture awardee is Dave Heisel. All right, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce this year's uh, Cedar Prize lecturer standing right beside me, uh, Mears Oppenheim. Mears is uh, Associate Chair of Astronomy at Boston University, where he's been just remarkably successful at attracting and then propelling along their way uh, extraordinarily accomplished uh, professionals uh, like Sigrid and others. And I think that's really the highest testament there is for uh, an educator. Before uh, going to Boston, uh, Mears worked with Marty Goldman's group uh, at University of Colorado and with Tor Hogg first before that uh, at the Max Planck, Planck Institute. And before that, uh, Mears was a graduate student at, at Cornell where we were contemporaries. And um, I remember very well that, that uh, he was developing really avant-garde computational tools to study the very same kinds of problems that I was um, examining experimentally. And I remember being sort of mildly worried that uh, the tools were going to work so well that he'd solve all the problems, and then where would that leave me? And then I thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, the computers are still pretty slow, and uh, these codes are really computationally expensive, and uh, there were some bugs, and there were some other issues. So I thought, uh, I probably have uh, 20 years before I really have to worry about this, so no problem. So, so here it is 20 years later, and Lo and behold, uh, all the problems are solved. So, um, so thanks a lot, Mears. Uh, it was nice while it lasted. And, your and uh, so I'm looking at, at my 401k plans. And uh, so, so to the graduate students, I can advise you, uh, think very carefully about your choice of office mates. And uh, to everyone else, uh, please uh, join me in congratulating Mears on this award. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, when uh, John Starr asked me to give this talk, he, uh, he said the committee, quote, asked for something that can appeal to a broad audience, is forward-looking, uh, probably even a bit provocative or edgy. And uh, my immediate response was, damn, I'm going to have to up my game a bit. Usually my goal is just not to suck. So, um, with that said, um, I was thinking about what I should talk about in this talk, since they don't really give you a particular topic they're giving you the award for. In oh. <laughs> Instead, what they do is say, take your pick. And since Sigrid was preceding me talking about meteors, I thought I would talk about general simulations of the ionosphere. Um, and this did start out as a graduate project um, oh, over, well, I guess about three Decades ago, when I got my undergraduate degree, I uh, was wondering what I would do at the next stage of my life. I really didn't want to go um, to graduate school. I didn't want to work on minutiae. Um, I used to say to people who said, are you going to graduate school? I said, nah, I don't really want to work on the left fiddle of the right battle. And uh, yeah, I was brilliant that way. Um, so, um, and so uh, I went and got a job. And as so many people did, I went to California, got a job, and, and uh, then after a couple years, I realized I was working on minutia. So I evolved into going back to graduate school, and uh, a lot of interesting and exciting things have come out of my minutia since that time. So I'm going to tell you about a few of them. Um, I'm going to tell you, well, first I'm going to introduce plasma physics, because I know not everybody in here um, knows plasma physics. Uh, Roger did a beautiful job on Monday introducing plasma physics. 
So I'm going to give a, a fairly similar five-minute all of plasma physics introduction. Then I'll tell you my favorite technique for attacking plasma physics problems, particle and cell codes. And then two examples, um, plasma, particle and cell codes applied to uh, meteor simulations. And you see a pretty picture on the, let's see if I can get this to work, on the right, left here. Um, and then something that just came out um, actually two months ago, my very first paper talking about something called 150 kilometer echoes, which I will also show you some simulation results. As I was writing this talk, I realized, you know, this isn't really just to talk about what I've done, but all the people that have influenced me as I've done it. And I owe such a huge debt to. I mean, my teachers from Cornell, um, and this is just a subset of them, uh, that taught me so much. My colleagues here, my students have been so amazing. Uh, my current collaborators. Um, you know, I've been just incredibly fortunate with the people that have basically opened doors for me and often pushed me through them even when I was rather unwilling. Um, and yeah, yes, so, okay. So with that introduction, let's do all of plasma physics in five minutes. You really can do it because you guys, almost everybody in this room has the background to do this. Um, plasma physics, of course, is dominated by the theory of electromagnetics, and I wrote down Maxwell's equations here, um, because plasma physics is the physics of the charged particles moving around. Um, and of course, because the charged particles are moving around and you just don't have a static situation like you do typically in electrodynamics, um, you have to have a Lorentz force accelerating the particles. So I wrote down the Lorentz force. Those are two of the primary assumptions. And then, of course, you need equations of motion, which could be relativistic or non-relativistic. I didn't put an equation down here, but it's rather trivial. Um, and that is probably, oh, I don't know, 80% of all of plasma physics right there. Even get to Coulomb collisions, because ultimately they are electromagnetic. So this is really the foundations of plasma physics. And uh, maybe the other 5% would be collisions with neutrals. Um, you know, because they're important, especially in the ionosphere, um, uh, particularly the lower ionosphere. And this is maybe 95% of classical plasma physics. But the reality is when you teach a plasma physics class, and I've had the good fortune of teaching the plasma physics many times, what you're really teaching is that this is really complicated, and it's too complicated, and there are too many particles, too many equations, and to get to any tractable answer to any problem in plasma physics, you need simplifications. And so really plasma physics is about those simplifications. So typically you start with uh, a plasma class going over those fundamental laws I just wrote down. And then you have to simplify them in some way. And the, the most minimalistic simplification is just to say, we're gonna ignore close range interactions of particles and n body interactions like three body or four body interactions and you get to kinetic theory. It's not a huge or really difficult set of an assumptions to get to kinetic theory, and they're still very hard to get concrete answers out of a lot of kinetic theory, although um, many amazing results have come out of there. Then, if you wanna deal with systems that are bigger and longer time scale, you go to fluid theory, which basically you say, okay, I'm not gonna really worry about the fact that at any one point in space, I can have particles going this way, or that way, or this way, or that way. I'm gonna assume I can characterize a um, distribution of charged particles with just a few parameters at any point in space, like a density, a velocity, a temperature, maybe an entropy. And I get multi-fluid theory. So you simplify down, simplify down to there. Of course, each of these steps takes about a week or two um, in a plasma class. And then you can uh, simplify things even further. Um, if you don't want to deal with the electron timescales, you say, okay, I'm going to toss out electron inertia. I'm going to assume quasi-neutrality and about a half dozen other assumptions that take you a couple of lectures to do. And you get to magnetohydrodynamic theory, um, which is, of course, a terrific word. And if you're on an airplane and you, the, your neighbor is very chatty and you don't have time to chat, you're working on a paper or something, and they ask you what you do, you say, I do magnetohydrodynamics theory. Dead silence. 
If you, on the other hand, say, I teach astronomy, it's, oh, I'm a Sagittarius and I love astrology. <laughs> so, you know, but terrific work. And of course, there are further assumptions that you can simplify things even more. Uh, I won't go into it. Pick simulations fit right here. We're really simulating at the kinetic theory point in plasma theory. Okay, so now five minute introduction to plasma physics. Um, and so now I'm gonna tell you about my favorite technique for doing kinetic theory. Uh, and that's the particle and cell simulation. Really a brute force, very easy to understand approach to simulating. And in fact, um, I have a new incoming grad student that's gonna be working with me. And his assignment for last week was to write a little pick code and he did it in three days. So the stuff I'm gonna tell you is really quite simple, the basics of it. So what you do to pick code is you assume there are a lot of particles with positions and velocities and you keep a list of the positions and a list of velocities and you know you have to define the range of locations. The velocities might have a Gaussian distribution, so you have to figure out how to do all that. And then of course the particles all interact through fields. Now you could of course use Coulomb's equation, that would be correct, um, and the forces would then enable you to figure out how each particle accelerates all the other particles. And you could do it that way, but then after you, since each particle has to talk to every particle, if you double the number of particles you have to do um, four times as many calculations, and quickly this becomes an intractable approach. So that's where the particle and cell method was developed, um, because this was far too slow. And so when I went to graduate school, my uh, advisor, Niels Otani, um, taught me a technique called particle and cell tech, um, simulations, and I'm forever indebted to him for doing so. Um, and it works like this. You basically, you say, okay, I'm gonna take all those charge distributions. Um, I have a list of electrons and a list of ions. The electrons here are green, the ions are in red. And I'm gonna not only have the particle list, but I'm also going to have a grid. Um, and what I'm gonna do is figure out the charge density on the grid. And it's mostly a counting process to figure out the charge density. So for instance, in this box here, I have no electrons and no ions, so I have no charge density. In this box, I have one ion and two electrons, so I have a negative one charge density, and so on and so forth. Computers really, all they can do is count. That's what they're good at. They're, they count very, very, very fast. Um, and so, and they're very good at keeping lists and being organized. So you just go and make this list, and this is, of course, a trivially small example, but once you have the charge density, and here's a a nice little equation saying what I just told you. Um, once you have the charge density, then you go to um, Gauss's law to calculate the electric field. Oh, by the way, this is an electrostatic particle and cell code. Um, electromagnetic particle and cell codes aren't that much harder, but you have to have Ampere and Faraday's law and do a time, um, a, an approximation of them. Um, it's a very well-established technology as well. This is slightly simpler. Um, and, uh, but it's electrostatic, which for those of you not familiar with plasma physics, really means that the magnetic field doesn't change, which means it really should be called magnetostatic, but we're stuck with this horrible nomenclature electrostatic, but it's terrible because this, the electric fields are changing, so they're in no way static. Okay, um, so in this magnetostatic simulation, I can calculate the electric field once I know rho, I can get E. There's a couple of techniques you can do that, spectral techniques, matrix methods. It's very well established. People have been able to do this since the 60s. In fact, many of these techniques were developed in the 60s, I think mostly at Los Alamos, mostly for nuclear weapons simulations, and then have been adapted to all of plasma physics. Um, and so you can get the electric field, then once you have an electric field, you can say, well, that electric field's gonna accelerate the particles. So again, I have my Lorentz equation. Um, I now have an electric field. I'm gonna assume a static magnetic field, and I have to put the velocity in there. I do a numerical approximation to this equation called the Boris mover, very high accuracy method. Then, well, because we're interested in the ionosphere, we usually have to have collisions. There's many places you do collisionless 
particle and cell codes, such as in magnetospheric physics, but we add collisions. In fact, that's sort of my expertise, is collisional particle and cell codes. And boy, will that shut down a conversation in an airplane even faster than magnetohydrodynamics. So, um, so uh, you colli collide the particles, then you update the positions, and then you go to step one because you have the particles have all moved around, so now you've got to get new charge densities, and you repeat and repeat and repeat. And computers are also really good at repeating um, over and over again. So that's the basic technique. Now, there are a lot of sort of quirks and foibles of this kind of technique. Um, two particles that are really close to each other basically don't talk to each other very much because they're in the same grid cell. But in a plasma physics, if you resolve the Debye length, that's actually a pretty good assumption, um, except you're neglecting collisions that you then put in separately. Um, and there, there are other quirks of the technique that I won't go into. Um, and there are more advanced ways to do this, too. This is the basic technique developed in the 60s. Um, but it is the foundational method, and it works very nicely. The other thing is, if you really want to get into the modern age with this sort of thing, uh, is you have to parallelize it. Fortunately, this technique, oops, that movie was not supposed to start. Oh, well. Um, you're uh, supposed to, you, to get to sort of modern size simulations, you have to parallelize it. PIC codes are easy to parallelize. It's just an organizational task. Once you have a PIC code, it takes a couple of extra days to figure out how to parallelize it. Um, depending on how, how parallel you want it to be. Uh, but I've got a uh, simulation I can run up over, I've run over 10,000 processors, millions of grid cells, and, and 10 to the 10th level particles. So um, you can do amazing things with that. And it's really brute force. I mean, you're really sort of probing the physics at a fundamental level. And then you can do numerical experiments to try and understand what the physics is teaching you. So this picture here you're seeing is Simulations of the farley bunemann instability. My entire career has been an outcome of simulations of the farley bunemann instability. This was my thesis project, although admittedly this is a simulation that I did many years later. What you're looking at here is the plasma density as a function of time, um, and it's probably 50 meters by 50 meters. And actually it extends in and out of the screen. This is just a cross section. It extends in and out of the screen couple hundred meters, okay? Um, and we learned a lot from this, and I've talked about this many, many times at CEDAR, so I'm not gonna talk about it there. Although we learned a huge amount just by doing my thesis, and that was a box probably one hundredth the size of this box, and we still learned a lot from it. Um, and, but this was the start of all my research, um, doing this kind of simulation, and like I, I like to say, a good thesis never dies. Um, I'm still working on my thesis project, although now we've expanded it a million fold in size and resolution, and we're looking at different aspects of it. Um, not the same things we figured out 20 years ago. Okay. Oh, also, I, I was showing this to a friend, and they said, oh, this would be great with about a quart of beer. So, you know, just staring at this, going up and down. Okay, so, so, you know, there's the old saying that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, I have a pick simulator, so everything looks like a pick simulation to me. And so, um, what was it, 18 years ago, in 1998, I was here at a CEDAR meeting, and two people, who many people in the room know, um, cornered me, Susan Avery and Art Richmond, and said, we have this problem. Um, we have been seeing weird observations from our meteor radars. And I have a picture of a meteor radar. I'm not going to go into how a specular meteor radar works. It's very different from what Sigrid just showed you. Um, the large radars, it's just a, you know, a few wires and uh, much lower frequency, typically. And, but they're used to probe winds all over the planet. And the problem is the winds, and you actually also try and get the temperatures from them, the winds and the temperatures that they were met detecting just didn't work above sort of, I don't know, 90, 98 kilometers. Um, when you tried to get a measurement above there, it just didn't make sense. And so they said, well, you're working on that same region of the atmosphere, because indeed, 
the farley bunemann instability goes in the lower E region of the ionosphere, and meteors ablate in the lower E region of the ionosphere for the most part. And so, uh, and so, you know, I thought, okay, that's an interesting topic, but what do I really know about meteors? Nothing. I mean, I know about pick simulations and the farley bunemann instability. But at the time, I was working with this fellow, Axel von Ent, um, who was a postdoc, had been a grad student a few years behind me, working with me, and we were trying to do the farley bunemann instability with natural large-scale gradients. And the simulations were just, I couldn't get to the big enough size to have the gradients be physically realistic. They were way too small. And we looked at what we were simulating by accident, realizing they weren't gradient drift simulations, they weren't gradient driven simulations, they were instead very small, gr uh, tight gradients looked a lot like meteors. Because what happens when you get a meteor going through the ionosphere, as Sigrid showed, or through the atmosphere, is it ablates and creates this column of highly dense plasma embedded in the low density I background ionosphere. And so you have really steep gradients. So to make a long story short, uh, we worked for another two years after that initial suggestion, and we put out um, our first paper. I worked with my first student, Lars Bureau, um, and we put out our first paper, Electrodynamics of Meteor Trail Evolution in the Equatorial E-Region Ionosphere. So um, I had no idea where, what this was going to lead to. It just seemed like an interesting curiosity, and we indeed to some degree answered a bit of Art's question of that the, what the plasma dynamics, what's going on, the complexity of the plasma physics as a function of altitude. We were able to say something about that with this first paper. Um, but then some really interesting additional things happened. Maybe the best thing ever happened was when a young uh, person walks into my office and says, look what I've collected, the data set I've collected um, as working as an analyst and the Kwajalein Atoll with this big um, platinum plated uh, radar called Altair. I've got these incredibly high precision, high resolution um, observations of meteors. I mean, nobody at the time had ever seen anything resolved like this. I mean, with these, this is again the range time plot where you have altitude versus time and you have a meteor head echo followed by what we call the non-spread, non-specular trail or range spread trail. And, you know, Sigurd walks in and says, I have this beautiful data set I've collected. I want to do a PhD. And not only that, I have full funding to cover me the whole time. So <laughs> how many times does that happen in the career of a professor? <laughs> Pretty much never. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, well, and from her and, uh, so many colleagues, uh, you know, she opened a big door for me, led me in the direction of observational data analysis. Um, that got furthered when I showed this data to uh, some colleagues that may look familiar, uh, Koki Chow and Dave Heisel, and they uh, said, hey, we can do that too at Hikamarka. We just have to change the settings on the radar. So they invited me down to Peru. I went down to Peru. Uh, uh, worked with this Hikamarka radar, and this is just an absolutely vast facility. It's, uh, you know, this is 18 soccer fields. This building holds 50 people without much trouble, including ping pong tables, and um, there's a swimming pool here. You can barely see the cars are too small to see in this picture. I mean, it's just a huge sensitive facility, and sure enough, it could see meteors that look a lot like the Altair meteors with the distinct head echo followed by the non-specular trail. Um, it could do interferometry as well. And even better than that, touring around Peru with Koki Chow and visiting all the amazing restaurants is just such a treat. I recommend it to anybody. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Peru, do not say no. The food is amazing. Um, it was, it was, we had a wonderful time. We collected a lot of data. And it was, in many ways, for my career at least, uh, revolutionary. Okay, so. But let me step back a little and tell you that, you know, I discovered as I was doing this project that actually meteors are quite important. Now, Sigrid did a terrific job, and I don't have to tell you about a lot of the importance of meteors, but there's a few things I should tell you about that wasn't mentioned. Um, for those of you who never thought much about meteors, uh, meteors are, are important in aeronomy as well as in, um, in 
dealing with impact spacecraft threats. Um, they're a source of metals in the upper atmosphere. We have this constant rain of particles. I mean, Hikamarka looks at a four kilometer squared area in space and sees two particles per second. I mean, that's how sensitive it is, but that's how many particles. There are millions of particles hitting the atmosphere above us every second right now. They're hitting us, us in a tiny little volume. Uh, millions of particles coming in all the time. They're depositing metals in what would otherwise be a very clean part of the upper atmosphere um, that modifies the chemistry, provides a source of dust for noctilucent clouds and PMSEs, long-lived E-region ions, uh, which affect nighttime conductivity, metal layers responsible for sporadic E, and maybe even more important, gives us something to reflect LIDAR off of um, and uh, to see the metal line. There's just, there's a lot of aronomy importance. Of course, it is also a solar system issue. The Earth is basically a giant particle detector. You know, you have, it's a cloud chamber for um, these high-speed particles. So we can answer the questions that Sigurd asked. Um, it's actually also, meteors are still used as a communication uh, reflector. You, HF signals bounce off of meteors and you get meteor burst communication. It allows you to talk over the horizon. So there's actually some practical things. And, you know, but the problem meteors has is it is an interdisciplinary field. And while I must say my experience is we give a lot of lip service to interdisciplinary fields, it's tricky to get it funded. And so I was worried that I wouldn't get funding. But I must say that the CEDAR community and the what is now called the geospace community was very... Uh, was very helpful and very open to jumping into new areas. I, I've been so impressed by this community over the years. And at the time, the leaders of the, both the, the CEDAR and um, Geospace was Rich Benke and Sushananda Basu. Um, and they were open to the idea of funding, broadly funding meteor research. And it, it's worked out rather well. OK, so with that said, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the SIP the, my latest simulations of meteor plasmas, because I think they're really cool. I hope you'll agree. Um, but it, it's a little tricky, okay? We can't really simulate the full process of a meteor. It's, you know, there's time scales from picoseconds to, you know, seconds. So we're gonna focus on sort of the millisecond time scale. Um, so the idea is that your meteoroid went through the atmosphere and created this column of high-density plasma embedded in the low-density ionosphere. And I'm trying to represent this here. And it's tricky to show something that's 3D with structure, right? Something that's optically thick and 3D. So what I do to show, illustrate the physics here is I have three isocontours. I just pick three density values, and I plot them as surfaces. They're actually slightly translucent. You can't quite see that yet, but as the simulation evolves, you can see it. Then I, the blue plane is just the background ionosphere, and it's just a color map of a cross-section through the background ionosphere. So you can see what's going on in that as well. Quite interesting, you'll see. Um, the Earth's geomagnetic field plays a very important role, and it's in the long direction. I have to make it the long direction, because stuff happens along B much faster than it happens perpendicular to B. Um, the whole simulation, I mean, this is a small meteor. The peak density is only 160 times the background density. That's not a big meteor, that's a little one, probably smaller than what we're typically seeing with the radars. Um, and the whole simulation is like 50 meters by 50 meters by a few hundred meters, okay? So it's, we're looking at a small bit. Now this is 4,000 processors with you know a billion par or trillion particles. Um, no, 10 billion particles or so. Um, very parallel simulation. Oh, also there's a wind blowing across the meteor which is absolutely typical, 100 meters per second, it's not an uncommon wind um, strength, and otherwise all the values we've chosen are fairly typical uh, for what you'd expect for a small meteor. But it's just a, we're really simulating a column of plasma. Uh, it's not a, we're not simulating the meteoroid as it's giving off the, creating the plasma. That's gone by already and made this column and left it behind. Okay, so here's what happens. First you get these wings spreading out along B. So well, that was a really cool thing we discovered from the simulation. Now I turn the simulation so you can see the waves developing, okay? And the waves develop and they evolve. 
and they get pushed a little bit by that wind. Um, and uh, and the, the waves evolve into really full up turbulence. Let me show that again because, well, we spent months getting this to work. <laughs> so, okay, first you get the wings. You can see the waves already starting in a linear stage. Now I spin it and cut it, and you can see the waves evolving into sort of almost, you can actually see there are convective rolls in here. It's very cool. Now this is all plasma turbulence. This is no, there's no neutral turbulence. There are neutrals, but they're just a collisional bath. They're just sort of sitting there, uh, not doing much. Because this is all happening on, you know, tens of milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds, the whole time scale of this simulation. So, okay, so what did we learn from this simulation? I mean, the point of simulations is not to mimic a particular meteor, okay? It's to learn the physics of meteor physics. So the first thing we learn is that these, you know, you get these waves, and the waves have the advantage that they actually allow the meteor to be seen by a radar. See, normally, if a, if a meteor is coming like this across, and you're looking straight at, up at it with a radar, if the meteor is coming like this, the radar energy will hit it and bounce off at some a angle. If the, if the meteor is really nice and clean and smooth, it acts like a mirror, and no energy goes back to the, to the radar. Um, and so you won't actually even see it uh, past the initial head echo. You see the head echo because that forms as the plasma is being created, but then it would disappear. And in fact, it does disappear. You remember that little gap, and then, and then it reappears, and we, we're pretty sure that's due to this small-scale turbulence, because um, this is sort of the three-meter turbulence. You need to see it with Beta Marca, or um, 70 centimeters, you need to see it with uh, Altair. Um, and the other thing is, the thing we learned from the simulations also is the wing formation. So, um, and, oops. And so, we actually figured out the wing formation. We actually worked on the theory of all this, um, but we neglected the wing formation. We thought it wasn't interesting or important. So, what we did is we said, well, this was the work of Jakob de Mont and myself, um, but basically said, okay, if you take a cross-section of the meteor, you can make a really simple model. So imagine that the meteor just went straight down into the page here, and you got a magnetic field threaded through, say, that way, okay? Just as an example. And this works for most meteors. Uh, now we're gonna do a really hyper-simplified model. We're gonna say the meteor plasma density is one constant here, and then the background density is another constant here. And then we, by making that nice cheat, we can just use Laplace's equation and solve. And you get some insight by making these nice simplified models. So what happens, of course, is you have electrons and ions, and their mobilities are different. The electrons along B travel very fast, right? They're high mobility. But perp to B, they're stuck on the Earth's geomagnetic fields, and they just gyrate. But the ion mobility um, is actually the ions in the region where meteors collide with neutrals, the ions are just collisional. They, they actually um, try to gyrate, but they collide more, frequency than they, more frequently than they gyrate, so they're not magnetized. And so they have a low mobility both along E and perp to E, along B and perp to B. And uh, so what happens is the electrons try and escape across B this way, but the electrons can't follow because they're stuck gyrating. Okay, they can follow slowly, but not very fast. And the opposite happens um, along B, the electrons try and escape, but the ions can't follow because they're collisionally limited in how fast they can go. So you get electric fields. You know, the, the electric field develops to keep the ions from separating too far from the electrons. Nature hates uh, non-quasi-neutral systems. They just don't last. And so the system tries to stay quasi-neutral. And so you get an electric field that way and an electric field that way. But Laplace's equation tells us that these electric fields have to be nice and smooth here. And they can't change very rapidly. And so in fact, the electric field has to propagate long distances away from the meteor. In fact, even modest sized meteors, these electric fields will go kilometers away. 
And they're volts per meter. They're the largest electric fields we ever see in the uh, ionosphere. And they'll go for kilometers. And the wings of the meteor are really what you're doing is that electric field is piling up the background plasma. So those wings weren't actually coming out of the meteor. They were the background plasma getting piled up by the ambipolar electric field. This is the ambipolar electric field. And so uh, Yako figured all this out beautifully and gave us, uh, you know, so we got some insight by working with the simulation and with the theory and, of course, observations as well. Well, okay, so that is um, just the start of our meteor research that really this stuff's now, uh, what is, I guess this came out in 2006, so 10 years old now. Um, amazing. Uh, but it's gone on. I, don't have time in a 45-minute talk to go on, but uh, you know this sort of exploded. You know, here I am, a, a PIC simulation nerd um, who knew a little bit about the Farley-Buneman instability, and after uh, 18 years of doing this research, we've had, uh, you know, if NASA ADS says 52 references, 28 referee papers, two and a half theses, and all these uh, students and colleagues have worked on it, and it's really been just so much fun. I never imagined I would go in this direction. Um, and we now have a much better understanding of exactly what we're looking at when we see um, these range time plots. You know, the head echo, we understand uh, uh, substantially from Sigrid's work, and these non-specular trails from the simulations and Yaakov's work. Uh, we have a much more complete understanding and description of them. And the point of that is then we can backtrack and say, well, what the hell does that mean about this space environment? We can use all this copious information. I mean, we get two of these a second from Hikamarka. So there's vast data sets here, and we can sort of back out, you know, what kind of a particle could make both these things, as much information as we can get if we understand the physical processes behind it. So that's been the sort of guiding idea, and it's the simulations and the observations and the uh, uh, theory go all going hand in hand and it's been a terrific project. Okay, so with that said, um, I wanna talk a little bit about my newest project. It's uh, called, uh, it was working on 150 kilometer echoes. This is a project that was triggered by basically these observations, um, which were originally made after the construction of Hikamarka in the early 60s, um, and they're, Again, it's a range time plot just showing the power. Um, and it shows the altitude here. And if you can't read it from the back, it's going from about 125 to 170 kilometers with the middle at about, well, I don't know, 145 kilometers or so. And this, you see this every day at Hikamarka. Um, and you see um, that it starts sort of a little after dawn. And then through the day, it gets lower and lower in the atmosphere and stronger and stronger. And then as we go to night, it, uh, um, it gets weaker and weaker and lifts back up. So, and of course, you see all this interesting substructure in there. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, the person who in the modern era has worked on this the most is probably Erhan Kudeki. Uh, some people think we should call these Kudekios. Um, and, uh, uh, Koki Chow gave the 2013 Cedar Prize lecture on this topic, going into all the details. So I assume you remember absolutely everything about them, and I don't have to tell you any more than this. Um, but, um, you know, so this is an obscure talk, uh, topic, and since I only have about seven minutes left, I'm going to just tell you some very, um, a few things about 150 kilometer echoes. And I've had only one paper on it, so I can tell you all about that one paper or actually I can tell you a little bit about that one paper. Um, but first, I'll show you a slide that Koki developed showing how interesting 150 kilometer echoes were. First paper, 1963 or 64, and then nothing until 1981, and then another one in 1992. So really not much interest until Chow and Woodman in 2004. And the interest shot up dramatically in 2004 because they, they, Chow and Woodman, showed that because these echoes have a very narrow Doppler width, you could get very clean um, Doppler shifts off them, and you could use them to probe the atmosphere as they go, the atmosphere goes up and down to very high precision. 
So it, it turned out these echoes were useful. And that caused a com explosion of papers as people uh, were sort of comparing the motions that they see with 150 kilometer echoes with other instruments and trying to see if this really does characterize things well. Well, that was true until, so there was you know, this in moderate level of interest going on until um, May, about a month and a half ago, when Fox News put out an article about 150 kilometer echoes. So, so somehow we hit Fox News science, at least the website. Um, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But the issue with these 150 kilometer echoes, the scientific issue was while we could see them every day and they were repetitious and they had all these patterns in them and they've been characterized carefully, you know, in, in a thousand different ways, um, we really didn't understand their origins. There were a couple of theories. One theory was gradient driven, another theory was sort of vibrational modes of, of extended uh, flux tubes. There were a couple of theories. So we had an alternate theory we put forward. Um, and this is our hypothesis. We said, look, they're there every day, weakest at dawn, strongest at noon, fading away towards dusk. So it's probably photon generated. And the photons create photoelectrons, and they don't create nice uniform photoelectrons. What comes out of the sun is complicated, including there's, uh, uh, well, these are measurements, satellite measurements of the photoelectron flux versus energy. Um, this goes from zero to 35 eV, but it doesn't really go from zero. This instrument can't go down below one eV. Um, and the cold bulk population is about 0.1 eV or even, even a third of that. Um, but you see, you have lines that are due to helium and you have actually sort of a funny structure due to nitrogen absorption. I can't go into the details of how you get this. But we said, look, you have this complex structure of photoelectrons. So we think that's the source. Um, and these photoelectrons create a shell of energetic electrons in, in velocity space. So if you plot velocity in one direction versus in velocity in the another direction, actually Vx, V parallel and V perp, you could call these, um, then you could see the core distribution of electrons and the photoelectrons, okay? This is a phase space plot showing velocity in both directions. And, you know, if you have a distribution of cold and a distribution of hot, at least in 1D, you get instabilities. Now, traditionally, one thinks that if you get a shell of these distributions, you don't get instabilities, it sort of all cancels out. But then if you thread it through with a magnetic field, it's been known since the 60s that you do once again get um, instabilities. It's pretty complicated magnetized kinetic theory to show this, but you do get instabilities. And so we thought you're gonna get this shell, you're gonna get instabilities, those are gonna create energetic electron waves, and if those energetic electron waves persist long enough, their electric fields will resonantly kick the ions, and if they can kick a resonant mode of the ions, or even get close to a resonant, they don't have to even be right on it, they're gonna enhance the modes of the ions, and that's what radars will pick up, okay? So that was our hypothesis, and actually I did this research, um, initially I did it sort of six, seven years ago, and I got nothing, and I dropped it. And then I revisited it because um, you have visited me in my office and wanted to work on these photoelectron problems, and I re-fired re up the simulator, and fortunately computers had gotten a lot more powerful in the six years, and I also discovered I'd made a dumb error. I had accidentally made the collision rates two orders of magnitude too high because I was using an algorithm designed for the lower E region, and here I am up at 150 kilometers, and it just didn't work, and so it, and so the collisions were just damping everything away. I was getting nothing, so I abandoned the project six years ago. I refired it up, and all of a sudden I started getting interesting stuff. And I'd like to say I can generate, show you some beautiful movies from that. Here's this phase space distribution, um, but they're not that exciting. You can see something funky is happening because the particles aren't heading into the core uniformly. They're heading in some funny, you know, non-uniform way. But it's, it's there are no great movies from this. It's that you don't have the beautiful Farley Buneman or the beautiful meteors. You just see enhanced noise for the most part. It's just, so I could show you movies, but they'd be boring and you'd all fall asleep. Um, so I won't show you any movies. And really to understand that these actually do seem to look like the observations, you have to look at the detailed spectra because radars are good at getting spectra. Simulations are good at generating spectra. So that's what we did. We compared the spectra and um, 
the reviewers thought it was a good storyline, so they, they uh, let me publish this paper, um, which came out, what is the date on this? It, it was like the end of April. Um, and I called up, I wrote up our hypothesis with these simulations in a reasonably modest sounding name, photoelectron induced waves, a likely source of 150 kilometer radar echoes and enhanced electron modes. Okay, sounds like a scientific paper. Clearly the reviewers liked it, said it should be highlighted. So something funny started to happen. I got a call from an intern at the AGU and they wrote up a nice blog and highlighted it. And, uh, and uh, you know, we were, I worked with Elizabeth Dietrich and we came up with this nice story and went on the web and new study explains source of mysterious radar echoes. Well, a little too definitive for my taste, but you know, I'm an equivocating scientist, right? Um, and so it was very nice, but then the next day I got a phone call from an, uh, a reporter at Science and he interviewed me for an hour and by the next morning this article appeared um, and the title was pretty good, Mysterious Radar Echoes in the Sky Explained with a question mark, that was good. Um, you know, because, <laughs> right? So, uh, but, but ambiguity is not really the way the mainstream press likes it and so live science called me up and interviewed me and um, they said, mystery of bizarre radar echoes solved 50 years later. At least they didn't put an exclamation point there, okay? But uh, it turns out live science is a feeder for lots of news organizations, so it shunted out, hit the Daily Mail, which is a bit of a rag in Britain. Um, here it's mysterious alien radar signals received on Earth at dawn every day could be echoes caused by the sun, particularly from dragons coming out of the sun. I, I don't know how they came up. Actually, it was a good article. They didn't really have any mistakes. Even the science article had one paragraph of gobbledygook. Um, but this was obviously written by a physicist. And then the editors got hold of the title and said, oh, it's boring, let's put in alien. So, uh, great. Der Spiegel picked it up. It was very nice, although I guess they didn't like any of our images, so they put a picture of Iscat and, and, <laughs> and uh, Aurora. This is strictly a, a, an equatorial phenomena. Okay, and then uh, a new scientist. Oh, the editor's there, really. Invisible radar wall caused in, in the atmosphere caused by UV from the sun. Okay, we have defense shields now, but you know, it only blocks about one part in 10 to the ninth of the energy, so not much of a wall. It's <laughs> um, okay, and then, uh, then we have mystery of bizarre radar echo solved 50 years later by Fox News. So, you know, the, the question marks have vanished very definitively. Of course, Fox News was fun, and the comment section is even more fun. <laughs> and there are pages and pages of them. Like climate science, their models reflect their bias, not reality. Maybe we'll find Obama's birth certificate in the ionosphere. But, okay. So you never know where your minutia will take you, right? And it can be a lot of fun. So, I mean, so I can step back for a moment. And, you know, I was thinking I would write a concluding slide, but there's no conclusion here. There's never really a conclusion in science. There's just more questions. We, we come up with answers on the way, but there's always some more questions. So, but there are lots of lessons learned along the way. Um, and one of the lessons I've learned is pick simulations, allow numerical experiments, and and it are basically numerical experiments and we can test ideas with them. And the other thing I learned, and I learned this the hard way, it wasn't something I naturally did, is scientific breath is really essential. You have to jump from topic to topic. And the US scientific system makes you do it. The three year proposal um, schedule or the five year proposal schedule really puts pressure on you to constantly do new things and so I've done, often kicking and screaming, but I've done lots of things as I think back over the last 23 years of my career, um, since I was a grad student. And, uh, you know, I started with this E-region Farley Buneman stuff. Um, then I got a postdoc where I used my pick codes for different things, bow shock turbulence, auroral acceleration region physics. Then, you know, the, the E-region turbulence turned into meteor theory simulations and observations. Thank you very much, Art. <laughs> Um, and uh, we worked a little bit on spread F simulations, 
uh, we now have a great project uh, where we're putting Farley Buneman effects into global models and watching the actually quite interesting consequences of that. And now we just started a project where we're looking at Farley Buneman waves on the sun. The solar atmosphere in the chromosphere has a collisional domain that's very similar to the lower ionosphere. And we can, we're pretty sure Farley Buneman waves go there. We can demonstrate that. What we don't know is do they do solve some of the unanswered questions like how does the solar atmosphere heat itself? And we think that might be possible that it's a major contributor. We're not sure. So we're working on that as well. So we're basically taking ionospheric lessons and applying to them to the sun. So um, not every project you venture into is going to pan out. I have no papers in either of these topics. It's a bit of an embarrassment. I really should put out some papers, but it's harder to get excited about results that don't bowl you over, you know. But unfortunately, if you never put out the paper or the failed experiment, then some poor person 20 years later might do it again. <laughs> um, okay, but that's another. So, you know, out of this career that really started with E-region turbulence and particle simulations, um, you know, dragged into working on minutia, much against my will. Um, you know, I've embraced the minutia. The people here have embraced me, and it's been terrific. So thank you very much.